Good morning. My name is Ricardo Simmons, and on behalf of Christ Church of Oak Brook, I want to welcome you to worship. As we gather here today, we are all aware that these last two weeks have been a time of tremendous pain and loss across our nation. If there ever was a time we needed to to, uh, we needed the grace of Jesus Christ and the wisdom we find in his words. Now is that time. For thousands of years, the people of God have turned to him in times of trouble and dared to pour out their hearts. They have come before him with anger, questions, fear, or sorrow, believing that the truth of what we feel and struggle with is always safe with God. The pattern of prayer, when we can't see clear solutions to the troubles we face when the burden of them feels almost too much to bear is called lament. Sometimes it is only when we have the courage to lament all that is so wrong in, our, in ourselves and, or our world that we find the ability to trust in God's power to redeem and to strive together again toward what is right. Listen to the lament of King David at a time when injustice, death, and division seem to rule in Israel. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer Lord, my God, give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing your praise, for you are good to me. And now, like David before us, let's bring our feelings, questions, and hopes for ourselves and our nation before God in a time of silent meditation. The Lord is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Though the earth shake and even though the mountains be cast into the heart of the sea, we will not fear, for God is with us. So let us trust in the Lord with all our heart. Let us not lean to our own understanding, but in all our ways let us acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. Let us sing in worship to the Lord.
Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I welcome you now to join me in a responsive prayer of worship as we bring before the Lord our God, our nation, and the conditions of our times. Were we together here in the sanctuary, this would normally work by me simply offering up to God a particular petition or concern, and then you offering a response as I lead. And the response today is, Lord of life, we lament this. I know that things are a bit different when we're there at home worshiping today, but I do want to encourage you to join me in this prayer today by either speaking aloud or by saying in the silent sanctuary of your heart those words, Lord of life, we lament this. And now I invite you as we come together before God in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our Lord and our God, the events of this past week and the weeks before have only further deepened our heartache over the broken state of affairs in our country, in our world, and even in ourselves right now. We know that you understand the variety of emotions and the experiences we bring to these things. You are the God who knows what your people carry. And you know what is truly required to heal our land and renew our lives. Please be that great God to us now. And in the biblical tradition of lamentation, we, like so many before us, come now to bring to you those broken places that we see around us and that we ourselves are a part of. We ask you to hear our prayers for the feelings of anger, despair, confusion, loss, and terror that run rampant today. Lord of life, we We lament lament this. this. We remember the division and the disputes that even discussing our problems now seems to create in our families, our friendships, and even our church. Lord of life, life, we we lament lament this. this. We name before you the vast volume of children growing up in broken families, schools, and neighborhoods. Lord of life, we We lament lament this. this. We think of the often ignored communities of our land where so many fear daily for their safety. Lord Lord of of life, We We lament lament this. this. We name before you the abuses of power experienced by our black and brown brothers and sisters more than most. Lord Lord of life, life. we we lament lament this. this. We acknowledge with tears the violent deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Philando Castile, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, and a very long list of others who have died unjustly and unnecessarily in too many stories to ignore. Lord of life, we lament this. We name also before you with grieving the numerous police officers like David Dorn, Lorne Ahrens, Michael Kroll, Michael J. Smith, Brent Thompson, Patrick Zamaripa, and security guards like Dave Patrick Underwood who have been injured or killed as they genuinely sought to protect and serve. Lord of life, we lament this. We remember the wanton destruction and looting of businesses and property. We think of the loss of income and jobs and livelihoods. Lord of life, we lament this. We name the many voices that are condemned or dismissed 
as they seek to speak to the pain of these times. Lord of life, we we lament lament this. this. O God who knows our hearts, we humbly and acknowledge and honestly acknowledge this day our very tendency to grow hard and cold and further divided even as these realities have been named right now. Lord of life, we We lament lament this. this. We acknowledge our temptation to grow indifferent as these stories unfold on a too regular basis. Lord Lord of life, life, we we lament lament this. this. We acknowledge our inclination to respond to evil with more evil. Lord Lord of life, life, we we lament lament this. this. We acknowledge our contentment with the truths we know and our resistance to seek more truth that could make us uncomfortable. Lord Lord of life, life, we we lament lament this. this. We acknowledge our temptation to defend or to accuse rather than to listen and to learn. Lord of life, life, we we lament lament this. this. We acknowledge our reluctance to look deeply for the roots of racism in our society or soul and our slowness to work for change in unjust systems. Lord of Lord of life, life, we we lament lament this. this. In our shared sorrow, Lord, we lay all of this at your feet. Please bring mercy on the grieving and justice for the wronged, Bring your protection for persons of any color at risk of violence as they go about their daily lives. Bring your protection for the men and women in all branches of law enforcement who seek to protect and serve. Give our leaders wisdom, discernment, and the courage to seek truth. Grant us the courage to keep naming and opposing evil where it rises up and the will to reach out to brothers and sisters of another skin color or life experience or point of view and truly respect and listen to them. Lord, give us the resolve to participate as a church and as individuals in working alongside of others to restore communities where trust and hope are low and violence is high. Give us your guidance. Give us your power, God, to change our country for the good and to witness by the unity of the church to God's vision for the reconciliation of this world to you and to one another. In the name of Jesus, our kinsman, redeemer, we pray. Amen.
Friends, as we come before the throne of our sovereign king this morning in prayer, let us be reminded, in fact, that his thoughts are not our thoughts and that his ways are way above our ways. Let us approach him in true humility with open hearts and minds. Though he's far above us, though he's far beyond us, he is right amongst us here today. And he listens attentively to the cries of our hearts. Let us join with the psalmist in Psalm 62, 8, where David invites us in this way, to trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Let us join together and truly pour out everything that's within us before his throne in prayer in these moments now. Let us pray. Almighty Father God, we come before you this day with our hearts breaking, with pain, with our minds in confusion, and our whole lives are bewildered. For many of us, we cannot even frame our feelings of devastation and loss into words. But you, the, by the Holy Spirit, know what's in our hearts even the groans that are too deep for words. But Lord, we do call upon you today. You've revealed yourself to be the God of all comfort, meaning all kinds of comfort. Lord, we ask you, as only you can, to surround and embrace in your arms of healing love the families of all that have lost loved ones, the family of George Floyd, as we've already lamented, the families of the many others who've lost their lives due to the violence that arose in the wake of this tragedy and many others. Lord Jesus, you yourself are acquainted with grief and you're especially attentive to the deepest cries of those whose hearts are broken and in pain. Be that healer today. Be that comforter today. Lord, we pray also for the countless ones who are grieving in a different way, the loss of their businesses, who've had their lives' works destroyed before their eyes as their places of business went up in flames. Breathe into their hearts the healing they need and inspiration to try again, to rebuild what's been broken down so they can continue to serve their communities across this nation. Lord, we ask you to intervene by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit and through us as your church to bring about the much needed changes in our society and in our world, to bring about real justice, your kind of justice to our land, to our communities, and to every single person that you loved enough to lay your life down for, to bring them redemption, salvation, and an abundant life. Lord, we continue to lift up as well those who are suffering from the COVID-19 virus, the tens of thousands of people and their families who are still in the throes of this pandemic around the world. They're out of the news now. They're not the center focus, but they're suffering nonetheless. We ask you to continue to bring healing to them and bring restoration to their family lives. And also, God, we ask that same blessing and grace upon all the real heroes in our medical profession and first responders who continue to this moment to serve courageously, selflessly, and tirelessly. And Lord, hear us now as we pray together the prayer that you yourself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm so glad you're all joining us for worship this morning. And I want to extend a special welcome to those that may be joining us for the very first time. If that's you and you'd like to connect with us in a direct way, I encourage you to click on the New Here button you'll see on your live stream page or the chat window that you're watching. Thank you so much for joining us. 
I also want to let everybody know about a very important event that we have scheduled this coming week. We're hosting a virtual town hall meeting this coming Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. That's June the 11th at 7 o'clock. It'll be led by our pastor, uh, Dr. Dan Meyer. He will be sharing about our plans, has been on the minds of so many, about our plans for reopening our buildings and for other activities, for worship and other activities and in-person gatherings. We've been shut down in that way only. We've still been reaching out in many other ways, but we're hoping to be able to share more details about the plan for us moving back towards what we would have normally called our church life here in the building. Secondly, you're going to be able to hear about our plans and initiatives to respond redemptively to the unrest in our country. You'll also have an opportunity to submit your questions and have those processed either through that virtual gathering or beyond that as we respond to it. You'll be able to jo join those, that gathering on Thursday evening the same way you're watching today through our live stream channels or through our Facebook Live as many of you are doing even now. I also want you to know that we did so well with the first survey that you participated and thank you to the 250 people who responded to our first survey that we've got another brief survey. It's about a five-minute survey that will help you tell us your thoughts and your feelings about reopening the church, re reopening all the ministries we've often had over the many years and coming back to that sense of normalcy and also to tell us how you're doing. We are still living into the next phase of coming out of this COVID pandemic and all of our lives have been disrupted. We want to hear how you're doing and the survey will help you to express those thoughts to us in a way that we can respond to you. We truly value your input. Lord, today as, as we come before the Lord to bring him his tithes and our offerings, I want you to consider something that Francis Chan shared in his book, Crazy Love, some time back. He said these words, my greatest fear is not that I will fail, but that I will succeed in something that doesn't really matter. Friends, when we give, when you give to the work of Jesus at Christ Church, you are giving to things that matter to Jesus. Your giving fuels the transformative work of Christ in us, in our children, in our communities around us. Your gifts, gifts help us proclaim God's message of hope, redemption, and reconciliation as well. You're supporting the very live stream that you're watching even now, you're supporting our connection groups, which are smaller gatherings by Zoom around our community so that we can remain in connection to others in this time of isolation that we've all come through. You're also supporting our many family ministries that minister to our children and our young people to keep them growing in their faith, growing to know and love Jesus and learning how that they can serve him. You're also supporting our many mission partners, both here in Chicagoland around the United States and also around the world who are carrying, carrying the message of Jesus, his love, his hope, and his help to the most destitute and needy people around the globe. Your, diff, your giving makes a difference. You can give simply the way that you've been doing it over the years by writing a check and mailing it into the church or dropping it off in one of the drop boxes at our church locations here in Oak Brook or in Lombard at our Butterfield campus. You can also give by clicking on the Give button right on your screen there or in the chat window. You can also text your gifts, as many of you have started doing, to either Christchurch or to Butterfield, excuse me, CCOB or Butterfield at 77977. I want to say thank you on behalf of all of us as leaders in the church and on behalf of the church, thank you for all of your faithful and consistent giving during this time of tumult and unrest and everything that's going on, your giving is making a big, big difference. May the Lord bless you today as you give. Gloria in excelsis Deo, Gloria, Gloria, Gloria in excelsis Deo, Gloria,
Well, good morning. If there was ever a morning where we needed to be together as the Church of Jesus Christ, I can't imagine a better morning. And so thank you for taking the time out to be with us today. You know, I asked God over and over again what he wanted me to share with you this morning. And he just very gently and very kindly continued to remind me that my job and our jobs as ministers of the gospel are not to provide answers, which is good because I don't have any answers. It's not to provide answers, but it's to orient ourselves and help one another orient ourselves and point us towards the very heart of God. And so as we travel through this message this morning, I'm just going to ask for you to give me some grace because I know I'm not going to get all the words right or maybe all the message right, but there is a space that I want to invite you into with me this morning, and it's the space where I hope we find the heart of God. A week ago, Friday, I set aside my day to begin working on this sermon. And I did what I so often do. I got up in the morning, I put on a pot of coffee, I threw some dishes in the dishwasher that were left out from the night before. I started to organize all my books and my study material. I flipped over my laptop. I settled into my favorite chair and I took my Bible and I opened it to the book of Ruth and I set it on one arm of the chair and I took my phone and I set it face up on the other side of the chair. And I was already feeling heavy as I know so many of you have been over the events that have happened over the last couple of weeks, in particular, the horrific death of George Floyd. And so with that weight, I sat down to work on this message and I wasn't sitting down for more than maybe 10 seconds when my phone lit up with the news from Minneapolis that the city was on fire, that local businesses and police precincts and, and people who had given their life's work to that place, they were destroyed and they were devastated. And I looked at my phone and I looked at my Bible and I said, Lord, sweet Jesus, what in the world does the book of Ruth have to do with anything that's happening in our world today? And then God gently reminded me that our story this morning in Ruth chapter 4 is about redemption. It's a story of a man because of his faith in an internal, eternal God and the loving kindness, the hesed that God had showed him time and time again. This man chooses to live a life that doesn't look like the culture around him. He chooses instead to use his influence and his power and his authority and his resources to stand in the gap on behalf of people who can't always stand for themselves. And when he does this, not only does he change the lives of the people that he is in direct, direct relationship with, but in partnership with the Most High God, he changes the story of generations to come. And then God reminded me that the redemption that happens in the book of Ruth during one of the darkest periods of the history of Israel is a microcosm. It's a foreshadowing. It is a light that points us to a larger redemption story that God has been weaving since the beginning of time that is ultimately and only fulfilled in the death and resurrection of the person of Jesus Christ. Friends, I hope we are listening and I hope we are listening hard to the stories today of people whose lives don't look like ours. I hope we are listening to the stories of our black and brown brothers and sisters who have felt the injustice of racism and often feel like they don't have a voice on their own. 
I hope we are listening to the stories of leaders who are working tirelessly on the front lines and communities and churches to do the hard work to bring systemic change to the issues that we're facing today. I hope we are listening to the good and faithful men and women who serve in law enforcement who are trying to protect the people they serve. I hope we're listening I hope we're listening to all of it, but friends, I don't know about you, but I've had trouble sorting through the noise. It's been a hard couple of weeks, and I've been searching for the right thing to do or the right thing to say, and the only thing that I can keep coming back to is the story that I want us to return to today, because it's the story I'm anchoring myself in, because it's the story of the condition of the human heart. And there is only one thing and has only ever been one thing that can change the condition of the human heart, and it is redemption. So we're not going to close our Bibles today. We are going to open them. And we're going to go into this story. We are going to enter into God's story of redemption because if we can't find light and hope and peace in this story at this moment, at this time in our history, friends, I don't know what story we find hope in. So if you can hang in there with me for the next couple minutes as we travel through the book of Ruth, I hope we're gonna go somewhere that's gonna bring a little bit of light. And so Father God, we humble ourselves. We humble ourselves before you and we ask that you open our hearts. Reveal yourself in truth and grace through the power of your Holy Spirit and show us, Lord, show us what we need to see. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, listen to the story of the fourth chapter of the book of Ruth. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, come over here, my friend, sit down. And so he went over and sat down. Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. And then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so, but if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi from the Ruth and, Ruth, and from Ruth the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. And at this, the kinsman redeemer said that I can't, I can't redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. Said, you redeem it yourself, I can't. And then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are my witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all of the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear, his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today, you are my witnesses. And then the elders and all those at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you've been following along our unexpected series, you know that this is the part of the story where things start to pick up steam. If the book of Ruth were a movie, it's where we'd start to hear the hopeful but faint underscore underlining the events that tells us that the end of the story is not quite here yet, but something good is about to happen. Chapter 4 begins with the word, meanwhile. And anytime we see a transition word like this in scripture, it should alert us to go back and make sure we know the context of what 
we are reading because meanwhile tells us that there is something else going on. There's something else at play when we are about to enter the scene that we are going to encounter. And the setup for that scene is what happened last week in chapter 3 after Naomi had devised this very risky and courageous plan to send Ruth to the threshing room floor to submit herself at the feet of Boaz, activating an ancient Mosaic law called the Kinsman Redeemer Law, in which Ruth is essentially letting Boaz know, I want you to be the one to redeem me. And we see this remarkable mutual respect and admiration between Ruth and Boaz that ends with Boaz declaring that he will indeed be the one that steps up and accepts this responsibility. Except there's one little problem. Boaz is not the first in line to marry Ruth. There is actually a closer relative, a kin, who could and should stand in the gap for these two women. And being the man of principle that Boaz is, he deeply admires Ruth. He values her. And he says he's going to do the right thing, and so he's going to present the closer kinsman redeemer with, redeemer with the opportunity to fulfill his obligation. And then he says, but he, if, it, if he is not willing, if he's not going to do it, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. And he sends Ruth home to Naomi, and as a parent, I imagine Naomi pacing the kitchen floor all night waiting for Ruth, and Ruth comes crashing through the door, and Naomi sits her down and says, tell me everything, tell me all the juicy details, and Ruth does. She lets it all spill out, and Naomi, this woman we have seen travel through the depths of grief and bitterness and lament, gets injected with a ray of hope from the Lord. And she says to Ruth with conviction and resolve, Boaz will not rest until the matter is taken care of today. And so meanwhile, meanwhile, Boaz heads to the city gate. The city gate during ancient times was a very important place. It was the only entry point of town. It was the heart of the community, the seat of the local government, the hub of local gossip, it was where business was conducted and it was the most logical place to look for someone coming and going. And so Boaz convenes a public court of 10 elders, he gains an audience and he sees the man who should have done the right thing, who should have stood in the gap for Naomi and Ruth and he calls out to him. He says, come over here my friend, come over and sit down. This word friend is actually translated Mr. No Name, Mr. So-and-so. It would be like you and I saying, hey, you, hey, buddy, come over here and sit down, which might tell us something about the opinion that Boaz and perhaps history had of this man for not doing the right thing. And in the presence of the elders and the people, Boaz begins to conduct the business transaction of Elimelech's estate, which we learn at this point in the story includes a large piece of property that has been laying fallow since Elimelech's death. And Boaz begins the transaction this way because the kinsman redeemer law has two parts. There's one part that's about the land and there's one part that's about the lineage. And so Boaz first puts Mr. So-and-so before him, the redemption of the land. This word redemption literally means to purchase, to buy back, to set free at a price. And Boaz tells Mr. So-and-so, you know, Naomi has been back here from Moab. She's been back for a while and she's been sitting on this piece of land and I thought maybe I'd just call your attention to it because you're the one that was actually supposed to do something about it and so I'm gonna give you the chance in front of all these people to redeem it because if you won't, I will. And Mr. So-and-so says, okay, I'll I'll redeem it, I will. And Boaz says, wonderful, (laughs) wonderful. And then he enacts the second part of the kinsman redeemer law which will require much more sacrifice than the first. He says, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, 
the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with the property. It would be a little like you and I going to purchase a house and being ready to sign on the dotted line and the realtor saying, hey, by the way, when you purchase this house, you get the family that comes with the house too. Except someday when you pass on, you don't get the house and your family doesn't get the house, but we're going to give it to this other family that you're buying the house on behalf. It's land plus lineage. And so the garden redeemer, when he realizes this, he says, I can't redeem it because it's going to cost me too much. I might endanger my own estate. And so Mr. So-and-so goes into self-protection because he knows what it would mean for him to redeem Naomi and Ruth, that if he did that, he would have to sacrifice his own family, his own comfort, his own resources for a future that did not belong to him. The real recipient of the blessing of the sacrifice would be the descendant of Ruth the Moabitess, the foreign, once pagan, barren widow that society didn't have much use for. And so Mr. So-and-so decides it would cost him too much that these two women created in the image of God were not worth it. And he walks away and he says, Boaz, you do it instead. And even though Boaz has to put forth the same amount of sacrifice, he boldly and courageously chooses to become part of God's redemptive story. And he turns to the crowd and he says, today you're my witnesses. I'm doing it right here in front of you. I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malan. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite. Malan's widow is my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with the property so that his name, his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today, you are my witnesses. And the whole community right there at the city gates goes on to celebrate shouting praises and blessing and honor over Ruth and Naomi. And we see that next week when we continue this series, we will see that because of Boaz's decision to accept God's call, to sacrifice his own good on behalf of someone else, to put God's hesed, his loving kindness, his mercy, his compassion, his grace because he decides to do that for someone else and put it on display for all to see, God continues the redemptive story that Ruth and Boaz become the parents of Obed, the grandfather of King David, the ancestor of our own kinsman, redeemer, King Jesus. So when we hold our Bible in one hand and we hold our phone in the other And we say, what in the world does this story have to do with this one? I hope this is a reminder that it shines light in the darkness. It's our anchor, the the story of redemption that goes something like this. During the days of the judges, the people of God had no king and did what was right in their own eyes. When the days of the judges ended, the people of Israel cried out for a human king, thinking that would make their nation strong. And God relented and gave them what they wanted. Over time, there were good kings and there were bad kings, and sometimes people drew close to God, and sometimes they were very far from God. But slowly, the people started to realize that their hope could not be found in any earthly king. God sent prophets to warn people about the condition of their human hearts. They said, confess, repent, lament, and turn your hearts back towards God. And for periods of time, many people did, but time and time again, the condition of the human heart caused people to blind themselves to the grace-filled, sacrificial, hesed way of life that God had called them to, and they hardened their hearts again. And eventually God removed his hand of protection from the people and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and Solomon's glorious temple where the very presence of God dwelled was burned to the ground. And the people of God were divided and they were scattered. 
And decades later, God's, God raised up new leaders with hearts on fire for him who wanted to see things change. God called them back to the promised land. They rebuilt the temple. They reestablished the law. They committed themselves to him in a new way, in a new way of life. And it worked for a time. But ultimately, they could not escape the condition of the human heart that had been weaving and slithering its way into the hearts of men since the days of Adam and Eve. And so the prophets cried out to the people, you can preach as loud as you want. You can preach in the city streets and you can preach in the temple courts, but what you actually need is something that you cannot do for yourself. You need a solution to the problem of the human heart. You need a new spirit. You need a new heart. And 400 years later, the descendant of Boaz and Ruth the Moabitess is born in Naomi's town of Bethlehem. And he preaches in the same fields of Judah that once experienced a famine, and he doesn't do anything that the people expected him to do. Instead, again and again, he uses his position and his power and his influence and his authority to stand in the gap for people who cannot stand for themselves. He looks people in the eye and he tells them that they have been created in the image of the most high God and that they have a purpose for their life. <clears throat> he fulfills the words of the prophet when he brings good news to the poor and he binds up the brokenhearted and he sets the captives free. <clears throat> he humbles himself to feast with sinners. He puts children on his knee. He heals the lepers and he restores sight to the blind. He extends mercy and compassion and grace and he brings justice to the land. And he uses every opportunity to teach about what the kingdom of heaven should look like on this earth. And when God's people fail to live the kind of life that he has called them to, he is filled with righteous anger and he calls them again to confess and to repent and live a new kind of life. He's betrayed by his friends, he's falsely accused, he's beaten and hung on a cross. He's crucified dead and buried on the th third day. He is raised from the dead to finally do the one thing that people cannot do from the history of time for themselves because sinful people don't choose to redeem God. God chooses to redeem his people. For it is by grace we have been saved, we have been redeemed, we have been bought back, we have been set free at a price. And that's the only, the only solution to the condition of the human heart. You see, Jesus didn't come to bring redemption to the world, he came to be the redeemer of the world. It's not just what he does, it's who he is. And friends, I believe with all of my heart that what God is pleading with us to do today is the people of God in this moment of time, in this moment of history, is to ask him, is to fall on our knees before our Father and say, Lord, how are you inviting me to be part of your redemptive story today? How are you inviting me to bring the sacrificial hesed that way of living to this earth because, friends, I do not believe that choosing the path of Mr. No Name, Mr. So-and-so is an option for the people of God today. It just is not. How we choose to stand in the gap. How we choose to step into God's redemptive story. It's gonna look a little different for each one of us. Maybe it's choosing a time of silence and confession and repentance. Maybe it's, it's changing the kinds of books we read and entering into new conversations. Maybe it's time to change the way we vote or where we invest our money or where we serve. Maybe it's in the way we choose to raise our children or maybe it's in the way we choose to lift up our own voice to share our own experience of its injustice that people need to hear. But church, 
beloved people of God. We are the ones, we are the ones who have been given new hearts. It is us, it is the church. And so if we can't humble ourselves and be the salt of the earth and the light of the world in the name of Jesus Christ to step into part of God's redemptive story, I don't know who can. I don't know who can. I don't know what other hope we have to hold on to. It's the only story I know that makes sense. You know, that same Friday morning when I saw the reports coming in out of Minneapolis, when my phone lit up, it lit up with another story at the same time. It was the memorial service of the great Christian evangelist and apologist, Ravi Zacharias. And I've actually never heard his story of redemption, and so I began to listen to how God met him as a 17-year-old man in a hospital bed in New Delhi, India, after he had tried to take his own life. And as he laid in that hospital bed, a man he had just met one time at a conference who led worship on stage, a youth leader, walked into his hospital room and he handed his mom a Bible. And his mom started to read the words of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And something happened inside of the heart of Ravi Zacharias, and he said he finally understood that he mattered to God. And he said he would spend the rest of his life, he vowed in that moment, to travel the world and tell other people that they mattered to God. And he said every time, many times throughout his life, he would go back and sit in the parking lot of that hospital in New Delhi, and he would just look at that hospital, and he would say, thank you, God, for this is where a miracle happened. This is where you bought me back for a price. This is where you redeemed me. Just a couple of days ago, I listened to another story. I listened to the story of a pastor in Houston, Texas, share about the redemptive work he is doing in the third ward, a neighborhood in Houston that they call the Bricks. It's a housing project. And he shared with a couple of the young men that he is discipling how they hold church services on a basketball court. And they baptize people in something that looks like a horse trough that they bring out. And he shared how George Floyd had actually used his own influence to pave the way for the church to be part of that community. And God just gave me this image of hope and the darkness, the thing that I am gonna hold on to and maybe you can hold on to too. He gave me this image of Ravi Zacharias and the men who had come to Christ and the projects in Houston, Texas, linking arms in the gates of heaven and singing praises to their creator God in this beautiful place where there is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free nor male or female. Just a bunch of people, all different colors and races and backgrounds who are created in the image of the most high God who are one And Jesus Christ standing shoulder to shoulder, lifting praise for the miracle of redemption to the one who had redeemed them. I know there is so much work that we have to do, so much. And friends, I am praying about how God wants me to step into that redemptive story, and I hope you are praying too. But meanwhile, (laughs) meanwhile, the eternal story of God's redemption is the one I am holding on to. Because someday, someday, it's the only story we'll see. Let's pray. (sighs) Father God, I thank you morning for your redemptive story. 
Lord, I pray if there are people who are listening today who don't know what that is about, who don't even know that you redeemed them, I pray that they will listen today, Lord, and they will step into your story, into your heart, into your kingdom in a new way, that they will accept that gift you have given to them. Lord, I pray for the rest of us, the redeemed of God, Lord, I pray that you would show us the way. Light the path so that we could be bold and courageous, Lord, about how you want us to step in your redemptive story. May it be so. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. friends, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I had so many friends praying for me this morning, and I kept telling them, please pray, I don't cry, and I almost made it. I got to the end of the message, so we were close. If you want some practical steps about how you can step into God's redemptive story, we have a whole list of resources for you on the homepage of our website. There's a big button that says Act Redemptively, and you can click on that and find all kinds of things that might give you a good place to start. I'd also encourage you to listen to our contemporary service at 1045, where our senior pastor, Dan Meyer, will bring a message and share his heart and share some more steps for you as well. But friends, for now, for now, receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he grant you his presence and bring you his peace, now and forevermore. In the name of Jesus, go today. Amen.